And then at the, uh, sometime at the end of the month, uh, a friend of mine who's a plant scientist bought a slide rule on the internet, showed it to me and told me, Eric, tell me how to use this. I said, why do you think I know how to use a slide rule? I asked. I said, well, you know how to do maths? I asked him, what do you want to do? I'll do that in my head. But anyway, no, he wanted to learn how to use a slide rule. Anyway, so he wanted instructions on how to use a slide rule. I'm going to do that uh, because I thought ah, it's a classic engineering thing. Engineers should be able to know about this thing. And I'll, I'll get up the, um, the spiral slide rule, which is an antique we have uh, on display in the department uh, that was bequeathed by the first head of department uh, to, uh, to show people how maths used to be done. <laughs> so I thought those things would be interesting. Uh, what am I doing today? Uh, I'm going to talk about Mino, uh, a platonic dialogue. Uh, in which the main question is, can excellence be taught? Okay, so what does it mean, can excellence be taught? And why, why is this important to you? Uh, but before I uh, get on to that, uh, this is Plato. Uh, this on the left is Plato in Raphael's The School of Athens, which finds its way into all of my lectures. Uh, and on the right, Aristotle. And over on the left, having an argument, Socrates, the hero of most of the Platonic dialogues. And... Uh, so Socrates in this dialogue is arguing or trying to explain to someone whether or not excellence can be taught. Uh, but uh, he, he actually thinks this is a question. Uh, the University of Cambridge, needless to say, I dredged up their mission statement. Uh, they don't think about these things even nearly as deeply. The university's mission and core values. Mission. The, university, the mission of the University of Cambridge is to contribute to society through the pursuit of education learning and research at the highest international levels of excellence. So there's no doubt uh, the Vice-Chancellor is 100% certain excellence can be taught. Not only that, it's a product for which you might like to fork over piles of money <laughs> and years of your life. Um, excellence uh, in this sense. Um, so the University of Cambridge answers yes, but I refuse to take their word for it. Um, excellence... Uh, let me start off with a definition, as I should, so that everyone involved knows precisely what is being talked about. Excellence, uh, in the Greek sense, translated from the word arete, uh, means it's also translated virtue. Uh, but I'm going to translate it as excellence, because it'll make more sense to an engineering audience. Excellence of any kind also means moral virtue. Uh, it basically, it's the notion of excellence is bound up with the notion of the fulfillment of purpose or function, uh, the act of living up to one's full potential. Excellence is essentially then a property uh, which leads to success in life. And here's where the question might become a bit, this is why it starts to become a bit more arguable. Because you may find yourself asking at some point, uh, I mean, may, I, I have offered you some wine before I ask you this question. You may find yourself asking the question, so why, uh, why did I sign up for this degree? You might find yourself asking that question. Um, separately, if, if you have no worries about that, you might instead uh, be if you've finished your degree a bit further along in your career and your department calls a meeting, a strategy meeting. You think, oh, God, no. But they call a strategy meeting and they say, well, we, want to, we, we know that at the moment we are excellent, which is to say, to say everyone says we're very good. But uh, how, do we, uh, how, how do we ensure in future uh, that we're still the best? Well, we need some sort of strategy uh, to ensure that excellence is created. So we need, uh, we need some sort of way of uh, remaining uh, very good. So the, the, how do we do this? Well, we have to think about it, and we essentially have to, to some extent, uh, teach uh, the next generation or teach ourselves uh, the property which is going to lead to success. So there are these two, two ways you see excellence might be important. Uh, but let's come back to the degree course. Um, so everyone, I mean, probably correctly, uh, is well, will have this, well, pe people will have decided to do a degree course because they think, I'm going to get some benefit from this. And uh, certainly all of the departments will have said, oh, yes, yes. Well, not only will you get these particular technical skills, but you will get these transferable skills. It will be marvellous. I was trying to dredge up one of the mission statements of the Centre for Doctoral Training to look up uh, what they were saying about uh, champions of the future. Mm -hmm. I couldn't find it uh, because it, it's, it, it's, it's disappeared somewhere among the labyrinthine website system. But it did promise uh, that if you were to study a PhD in this particular thing, it would make you a champion, which is pretty much 
uh, bang on the same concept of it's, it's going to lead to great future success. So they, uh, they have no idea, they know, no doubt uh, that their teaching is going to provide excellence, um, but then maybe we'd like to look a bit further closely as to how, so that you know what bits of your course you might like to be uh, concentrating on. And we might even want to ask the more extreme version of the question, uh, which Mino starts off with in the dialogue, which is, can excellence be taught at all? Okay. Uh, so that's the frame question. So it's, what kind of education is worthwhile? Uh, in fact, first question, is there any kind of education which is worthwhile? Um, the intuitive answer is yes. But wait until you see the dialogue. Um, why do successful cities, countries, institutions not last? So this is a question which is asked today by university departments. It's um, how can we ensure that we uh, remain at the top of a league table? And if you look back in history, has any um, top country, like in this case the city of Athens, has it ever remained the most important of its type permanently? No, they've never lasted. Um, so can we plan for success and how? Uh, is the question that you'd like to be able to answer. Uh, but initial question, is it theoretically possible that you can plan for success or teach excellence? So I'll, talk, uh, I'll, I'll get to the frame question. Um, answering this kind of question, this is a philosophy question. And I thought I would put up a slide saying the difference between a philosophy question and a proper engineering or science question of the type that we all understand how to do. Uh, because the way that we deal with these is quite different, and I thought, uh, these books are well worth your reading. Um, the Platonic Dialogues are quite accessible, they're well worth reading, but it might be helpful um, if you want to read them as a Natsuki or engineer uh, to have uh, my uh, introduction, because one of the reasons I tripped over on starting to read some philosophy is because they have a very different structure to the way a science course goes. So I'll talk a bit about that. Um, I'll talk a bit about some history because you might not know much about classical Athens, uh, but I'll explain why they're particularly interested in this question uh, as to whether they can guarantee future success. And then I'll just talk about the dialogue. So the main people are Socrates and Mino, and then I'll go through the, the key ideas which they discuss. And it'll probably, probably take another half hour or so, I expect. Probably. But you think I've timed this. I've only just finished writing it. Um, Philosophy for engineers and Natsuki. Why are the classics relevant? Well, I've said why I think they're relevant, because it informs, it, assuming the answer is yes, it informs what you're going to be trying to take away from your university courses. Um, or it informs, if you're hiring in a management consultant, uh, whether or not you sit there twiddling your thumbs thinking this was, this was always theoretically going to be a waste of time, uh, because they were never going to be able to tell us anything useful. Or maybe they were. Uh, anyway, typical science course, and I, so the word typical is quite important here. If you take any of my uh, science courses, I say a typical science course looks like this. It starts with a statement of principles. So if I teach you corrosion science, I'll tell you corrosion is X, it's the deterioration of material for chemical interaction with the environment. Our assumptions are Y, uh, reductive physicalism is true, uh, the following of thermodynamics is true. So you have principles to start with. Most of the work in a typical science course involves building on these principles. And uh, interesting property, it can be perfectly learned chunk-wise. So that if I teach you corrosion, what I think is a fairly typical science uh, engineering course, um, you can learn it chunk-wise, meaning uh, you can learn, first of all, the thermodynamics of answering the question, does corrosion happen? And you could then, if you wanted, stop there, not bother to learn the rest of the course, come to the exam, Go through the question, find the bit on thermodynamics, answer that, get full marks on that, and then strategically skip because you haven't read anything about kinetics. Uh, you could um, learn the chunk of the course, and you wouldn't have to do the further building, but you'd still understand it perfectly. Uh, this, this is typical. I'm not saying all sciences are like this. I'll come back to that. Typical philosophy book uh, is a lot more inaccessible if you have a, a physics engineering background uh, because they start with a question instead of a statement of, uh, what things are. And the questions, so the, the big questions um, are how should we live? That's the question which defines the subject ethics. What is there? Uh, I'm taking in liberty, but what is there is basically the question which defines metaphysics. Uh, what is the nature of being? Modern metaphysics is a bit harder than that. Uh, 
but what is there? Um, what is the nature of existence? And then what is knowledge? Uh, so that's epistemology. Um, most of the work in philosophy is not actually to build on starting principles. It's actually to find out what the what some plausible starting principles are from which you could answer that question. Um, and the result of that is that uh, philosophy courses more so than science engineering. Uh, they only make the course only makes sense often when there is a whole system. Uh, in particular, one of the reasons Plato is very important is because he's, he's, the he's the first of the great system designers. So he decided, he realized, um, all of these questions are awfully hard taken individually. And the only way you can actually come up with a, a proper, solid answer to any of them is to simultaneously answer all of them. Therefore, you have to build a complete system. That's what he does in the Republic, which comes well after Mino, and is more, and it's a lot more, there's a lot more to it. Um, but in the Republic, uh, he answers all of those big questions together, provides a complete system, and it's never been absolutely comprehensively improved on, although for sure people say he got bits wrong. So he's one of the great system designers. Immanuel Kant is another one. Uh, there are probably others, but uh, it's not my subject. Uh, anyway, philosophy works as a, a typical philosophy. looks like you have to answer the whole thing for, it, for each bit of it to make full sense. Um, there are some science courses that are, that, are, that are quite like what I've called the typical philosophy book in that way. Uh, you're welcome to suggest to me any that I've missed, but the two I would especially mention are thermodynamics <coughs> and <coughs> statistics. Um, thermodynamics, uh, you've all done thermodynamics probably. Uh, you'll have come across that somewhere at the start of the handout, you'll have the first law of thermodynamics. Um, no, let's say the zeroth law of thermodynamics, let's make it easier, uh, is as follows, and it's to do with equilibrium. And you write down, this allows us to define a temperature T, and then quickly you're sped along onto something, and then you get to the second law, and you immediately get confused as to why they're writing down a sentence and some algebra at the same time, and you forget about the zeroth law. And then you get all the way through, quite a long way through the course, you come to the Carnot cycle, the ideal heat engine, and at the end of that, only at the end of that, uh, does your temperature T, which you wrote down next to the zeroth law and thought it was perfectly defined there, only once you get past the Carnot cycle, essentially you've got a nearly complete basic course at that point, uh, only there does temperature actually make sense properly as to what it is. Um, so thermodynamics is something that only works as a whole system to quite a large extent. And so thermodynamics, the question is, what is the relation of work and heat or something? Um, statistics is quite similar, um, in my view, because it starts with the question, how do we learn scientifically from data? And it ends up that until you've invented possible different ways of doing it, frequentist statistics, Bayesian statistics, you can't really make a sensible call as to which one you should be using although the frequentists would be annoyed by that suggestion. Right. Um, so there, um, there's a difference between a typical science book, typical philosophy book. So because of that difference, I flagged that up. That's something to watch out for, I think, if you start reading through some books on philosophy. Um, uh, a follow-up comment of that is that these are good books to flip through without just skip over chunks. And if you're lucky, that it will, be, it will make sense in some later chapter um, what something means, which didn't make sense at the start. Uh, that's definitely the set, definitely true with Kant. Um, anyway, but I'm going to talk about Mino today. So if you want, you can go to my YouTube channel uh, where uh, I put up various things, but I will possibly put up the recording from this talk. Um, and you can listen to my audiobook of Mino if you would like, or you can get a public domain translation easily enough, or you can find other people's audiobook translations. Uh, if you think that mine isn't quite right. Audiobook, not translation. Um, audiobook uh, readings. But I thought it's easier to listen to a, an audiobook than it is to actually read something. Oh, especially because um, al almost all platonic dialogues are pretty much written to be performed. So they, they could be uh, performed as a drama uh, by people uh, not read. And they make more sense, actually, as a drama. Because there's um, there's some implicit stuff to do with the personalities of the speakers, which is sort of important to for, to, to understand. Okay, uh, so that's the audiobook. Um, here's some 
background on classical Athens, and this is why the question, can uh, excellence be taught, is important to you. So you've got classical Athens, um, so this is the, uh, the classical era of uh, Greece, so this is Overall, the classical period is between about 500 and 300 BC. Uh, you have, uh, just after 500 BC, you have various battles of Marathon, Thermopylae, Salamis, Plataea, and Mycale, uh, at which the, uh, the, uh, the Greek city-states beat off uh, the Persians under Darius I and Xerxes I, and uh, then certainly started to consider themselves uh, the civilized free world. Um, and uh, they began to do very well for themselves. And so in this period, Athens was, at the start of this, uh, the leader of the Delian League. So that was the most important of the, of the Greek federations, along with the Spartans. Uh, they uh, ensured the, the Persians were duly kicked out of Greece. And uh, Athens then uh, did uh, extremely well for uh, many decades uh, under the legendary Pericles. And um, uh, they also had the... Uh, uh, the legendary Thermistocles, the general who was in charge of the Delian League. Uh, they did very well, uh, but then, and this is partly what needs to be explained, uh, although they were doing very well, uh, Athens then got into a scrap in the Peloponnesian War with Sparta, and being a democracy, Athens eventually cocked up uh, critically, and so they lost the Peloponnesian War. Plague was involved as well, so they lost to the Spartans, but they recovered again. So by the time Plato is writing... Uh, post-400 BC, Athens is once again doing very well. But the question is, well, why is it that, we, uh, wh wh why is it that our, our political system got beaten uh, by the Spartans? Uh, how should we have redesigned our political system uh, to guarantee success in that and future uh, wars? Um, anyway, Plato... Um, oh, and by the way, Plato is, 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 is essentially his channel name. So in the same way that you get to choose a name for your YouTube channel, in the old days you used to get to choose a pen name. So Plato, uh, his, his actual name is almost certainly Aristocles, uh, but Plato, uh, potentially uh, a nickname because he had very broad shoulders, or otherwise just because he, was, uh, because he uh, provides a very broad foundation of philosophy that other things are built on, uh, he went for Plato, uh, and that's how he signed himself. Anyway, so... Um, after the Peloponnesian War, he went uh, travelling in Italy, Sicily, and I think it's quite important, Egypt, for about 20 years, and 15 or so. And then he came back to Athens. He was from a rich family, so he founded the Academy uh, on this site, and he wrote the uh, genre-defining philosophy, so he provided the first great system answers uh, to these questions in philosophy in the Republic, or as he had it, uh, Politeia. The book makes more sense if it's called Politeia than if it does when it's called Republic. Republic is the Latin translation by Cicero because he was Cicero was trying to amplify to make people really like the idea of the Roman Republic, so he just translated Plato's Politeia and retitled it Republic uh, in order to amplify the Roman system. But anyway, um, regardless, the ideas uh, are the uh, the foundation of Western philosophy, certainly. Um, in the Republic, and um, the Mino is one of the last of the early dialogues where he's putting together chunks of ideas which are going to be used to build his complete system answer. Okay. Yeah, Plato, you probably know, he's the, he's the intermediate, he's the, the second of the big three of, Greek, of ancient Greek philosophy. Um, so Plato was Socrates' student, Aristotle was Plato's student. Their ideas, uh, their core ones are those, but I've talked about that before. So the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy says of Plato, so that you don't have to take my word for it, uh, Plato is by any reckoning one of the most dazzling writers in the Western liter literary tradition and the most penetrating, wide-ranging and influential author, or one of them, in the history of philosophy. Uh, blah, 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 blah. In practically every age, there have been philosophers who count themselves Platonists in some regard. And uh, you might not, uh, but if you believe in universal laws of physics, uh, you are in that respect drawing on uh, Plato's concept of um, the theory of forms, which provides the prototype concept for um, things which are universally true everywhere and at all times, in the same way that laws of physics are taken to be like that. But laws of physics are just a special case of the theory of forms, which happens to work really well. 
Um, few other authors in the history of Western philosophy approximate Plato in depth and range, uh, perhaps only Aristotle, Plato's student, and Immanuel Kant would generally be agreed to be of the same rank. Aristotle's very hard to read, so we're, I'm skipping over him uh, this summer. Uh, and here are, here are your uh, statues. Socrates famously ugly, Plato looks like that, and Aristotle looks like that. At least that's what the statues look like. So why uh, Athenians wanted to know if excellence was teachable? So they had this guy's Pericles, under which Athens was doing spectacularly well. Um, but then they lost the Peloponnesian Wars to the Sparta, and they have, and then they, so they were then struggling with the question, um, was there a way that we could have avoided that problem, and can we guarantee that our city remains the best ever, um, forever into the future? So in other words, they were asking a, a version of the question, is it possible to keep America great? Uh, so they were, they were essentially doing this, and they said, okay, so they knew this had never been achieved before. Because, as I said, so Plato had been, he's by this point about 40 or so, and he'd been travelling around the world, and in particular, as I said, he'd been to Egypt. So he'd been to Egypt, so he would have, I don't know if he would have known that there were like, let's say, uh, let's say 25 dynasties or something, large numbers of dynasties. The point is, none of those lasted forever. 25 is pretty good, it's pretty good inductive proof that no dynasty lasts forever, or nothing remains successful forever. But uh, the Greeks said, well, okay, so no one's been able to do this before, but we've been recently inventing uh, this thing called philosophy. And I think the, the enthusiasm in classical Athens for philosophy, uh, in order to uh, see how much it was, uh, you should compare it with the enthusiasm that people have today for, uh, let's say, the possibilities of the internet, or you may have come, have you come across the concept of the technological singularity. Have you come across this term? No, it's, yes, it's a computer science term, isn't it? More or less. And what is it? Um, <clears throat> the idea that if, um, if most technological progress follows some version of exponential increase, you will at some point get to the point where, I think, I mean, there are different versions, but usually we end up at the point where technology starts improving itself without any interaction and then... Yep, that's exactly right. It's all about intelligent machines. So uh, computers get better and better until they become better not only at tasks of designing things like heat exchangers, but better at the task of designing better computers, leading to an exponential growth in our ability, or at least the ability of machine intelligences, uh, to um, advance themselves far faster than, say, uh, we could improve the ability of the human brain by better educational methods or something. So the technological singularity, uh, the idea that there will be a... Uh, a paradigm shift in, in the greatness of our technology, uh, leading to a radical new world which uh, has any kind of science fiction properties people like to talk about. Um, for example, they like to talk about, uh, oh well, they'll have these machine intelligences, they'll be, doing, they'll be sorting everything out, and they'll be able to pay for us to have a universal basic income. It's an idea which gets bounced around uh, people in the universities these days, uh, because the machines will do all the work for us. And, uh, Anyway, this is blind optimism, but the same blind optimism um, uh, that we, uh, that plenty of people have today for what will be made possible through technological progress, amazing new medical discoveries and all that stuff, um, astonishing nanomaterials, uh, or as I like to call it, better quality mud uh, mm -hmm. that we have, that we're developing. Uh, the enthusiasm people have today for uh, exponentially advancing technology, uh, the Athenians had for the fairly recently developed approach of philosophy. So they had this idea that, uh, well, the reason no other civilization has lasted forever is because they haven't cracked, it, they haven't solved what is a solvable problem, which is the correct answer to how should we set up politic how should we set up a political system. And they thought, if you have a correct answer to that political philosophy question, uh, then you could have a, a civilization that lasts forever and is guaranteed to be, uh, uh, well, uh, maximally splendid. And this would be great. Um, so that's what they wanted to do. Uh, so obviously, so, so they wanted a way of saying that, uh, well, we're going, we know that at some point we're going to need a new, a new head of state in the future, but we want to guarantee, we want a way of guaranteeing that we, uh, every time we get a new one, they're always brilliant. They want every, every time they want to have this feeling of a splendid new leader striding uh, into, the, into, into control. 
and this will be possible if we have a correct political system that we've solved. So that's why they were interested in the political philosophy of excellence, because if you can teach it, then you can always have a perfect political leader, like Pericles or Boris. And, um, but how to do that follows on from can excellence be taught? Um, which is, uh, let's come back to the framing question of that. Okay, so uh, this, qu this, this question is asked uh, by the characters in the dialogue Mina. And to understand, uh, anyway, the two, uh, so this should say, yeah, this, the two main characters, not quite the only ones. Uh, so to think of who these characters are, you have on the left from Assassin's Creed, Odyssey, uh, Socrates, an Athenian. Socrates is incredibly clever. He's also very sarcastic. Which is one of the reasons I love these dialogues. <laughs> they just tell people, oh no, I think you all have a better answer than I do. And I think, well, I'm going I'm to use that in a lecture or something. And uh, that, uh, he's very clever. Socrates is great. And he was famous historically, this is true. He would drag people into long philosophical conversations. And he's famous for leaving them more confused than they were when they started the conversation. And anyway, he is visited by Meno, or uh, it's an epsilon. So apparently it should be Meno. I was told by a Greek teacher that I should be saying it Mino, but I was also told that so, so I should be saying it Meno, but I was also told so many people saying Mino, I'm not going to be told I'm wrong. Here's a visitor from Thessaly who has come to Athens, and uh, the, what you think of him is he's like Bertie Wooster, he's educated, but he's not actually that bright. And he also asks impertinent questions, so that the dialogue, it's, 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 it's quite funny if it's done, I think, if it's done as a drama, that whereas most of the platonic dialogue, they, they, most of the dialogues involve a bit of setup, like somebody knocks on Socrates' door and wakes him up, <laughs> and he, he has to figure out what's going on. And then he discovers this guy has woken him up because he's very excited uh, to have learned that a famous philosopher, Protagoras, has come to Athens and he wants to get Socrates up so they can go and see him immediately. And Socrates tells him, yeah, I know, I went to see him two days ago. But um, anyway, so instead, this does, so Mino opens up with uh, uh, just essentially, uh, Mino sidles up to Socrates and just opens out of nowhere with the question, ah, Socrates, can virtue be taught? It's just a cold opening. That imagine someone comes up to you at a party and asks you a really annoyingly difficult question about your specialist subject, and you know this is going to take ages to answer. And he's just wandered up as if you're going to tell him in one sentence or something. Uh, so this is, the, this is the way you think of the character of Mino. Um, so he comes up and he asks, so Socrates, so can, can excellence be taught? Socrates rolls his eyes, basically. He says, I don't know Mino. Uh, which is his general answer, is to deny knowing the answer, because that means that Socrates can then drag this person into a conversation because it abuses Socrates uh, to prove to people that they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, so, uh, as I said, excellence means what, what causes success. So, uh, Mino says, well, am I to go back to my uh, home of Thessaly and tell everyone that uh, you don't know whether excellence can be taught? I thought, I thought you were supposed to be clever. And Socrates deals with this. And, uh, explains to me, now you've asked the wrong question. Obviously you should first have asked, what is excellence? And then we could answer the question, can excellence be taught? And this would be the proper way to do it, Socrates says. Although he probably knows that you can actually only answer all of those at the same time as a system answer. Anyway, so Mino is then uh, uh, duped into making some attempts. He's not a complete idiot, so he makes reasonable attempts at answering what is excellence. And uh, so there's, there's, uh, I've got about, this, is, there's, this is the first of about four slides on what's actually in the dialogue, so I thought you'd like to see roughly what that is. Um, so the first part is Mino attempting to answer what is excellence, uh, what is it that causes success in a way that uh, will satisfy Socrates, so that Socrates then promises to answer Mino's question as to whether it can be taught if they have a, a satisfactory definition. This would be more like answering in a science course, well, if you've got your principle, uh, it's easy to add chunks to it and answer, is it teachable? So, uh, Mino's the first attempt is awful. He says, well, there are many kinds of excellence, Socrates. Uh, see, he says, uh, well, for example, there's 
the virtue of a man. I'm going to enjoy this. There's the virtue of a man, which is basically um, how to uh, properly administer the business of the city and to make money and to, uh, to help his friends and harm his enemies. And then he says, you're going to know. If you want to know, I can tell you what the virtue of a woman is as well. It's, he says, he says that the virtue of a woman is to um, to be good at household management and to um, to obey her husband. And then he goes, <laughs> "This is what he, this is exactly what he says." Point is, it turns out it, it is actually a terrible answer. Um, he basically comes up with well, there's these list of uh, vir- there's lots of these virtues. Justice is probably a good one. So you've got to behave justly. Uh, you've got to behave with courage. This, end, this anyway, is a garbage answer. So this is the swarm of bees criticism that Socrates was. It's like I asked you, what is a bee? And you just said, well, here are some bees. <laughs> so there's this one and this one and this one. Then Socrates points out, this is a list, Mino, not a description of a property, which is what I asked you for. I said. <laughs> so Mino has a second go. And uh, so he said, excellence is the ability to rule, he says, so to essentially to make things go properly. Um, And this is not actually, this is not such a bad attempt. Um, It's still, uh, Socrates says, this is not, uh, the ability to rule is not the essential property which leads to success. Uh, For example, uh, would it be suitable for some school kid who have the ability to rule um, if they were at school, and this, if they were supposed to be doing what they're told so that they can learn properly. No, the ability for them to, uh, to be in charge would not be good at all, he says. Anyway, it's, it's a better attempt. Uh, his third attempt, which is actually, this is actually starts to become fairly decent, um, his third attempt, you know, says, okay, excellence is the desire and ability of obtaining good stuff. And this is a this is a proper attempt. Good stuff they agreed. At, well, they just yeah. So at this point, the good stuff they agreed was just a list, and they agreed that we'll just take this list for the sake of argument. Uh, health, gold, uh, political office, uh, things like this. That uh, uh, honors um, like gongs, and knighthoods, and things. Uh, these are uh, these are goods. Um, and this is not such a bad answer. And actually, so Socrates' final answer comes back to use a bit of this. But uh, the problem that he has, the problem that has, Socrates has with it, is that there's, there's a complicated um, line of reasoning in Plato that knowledge is a very absolute thing. Uh, um, uh, sorry, there's a complicated argument which nobody wants something which they know is bad. So all people want things which they believe to be good. Um, and so, first of all, he knocks away this first part of it. And so, there's no such thing as a desire of obtaining good stuff, because everyone has that. So that's a non-specific property. He says there's only uh, ability to obtain good goods. Um, but then he goes on, to the, which he, and then he can defeat that by saying, well, is the ability to obtain gold by stealing it a good a, a excellence? Mino is forced to admit no. Uh, he has to admit yes. Um, so excellence, then, it's the means of obtaining goods, but only if it's done, uh, they, they agree, justly. So um, excellence is the ability to obtain good stuff uh, justly. But this is a critical problem because they'd agreed earlier on that justice was a an aspect of excellence. So all they've managed to do is create a circular definition that they said they've agreed that excellence is um, doing something with an aspect of excellence, an entirely useless answer. Uh, a pretty much circular definition. Um, although there's a bit that's worth coming back to. Um, I'm going to skip over. Socrates is asked to give some definitions, uh, some examples of a good definition, uh, because Mino's not happy that he's not allowed to use circular definitions, uh, because he thinks that using these lists of things is a brilliant idea. Um, so he asks uh, Socrates to give some definitions like shape or colour. Socrates winds him up by giving the answer to one of those. Shape is the only thing which always accompanies colour. And then he gives the definition of colour. 
<laughs> and Mino says, well, what if I'd asked you that the other way around? You'd probably say colour is the thing which accompanies shape. And Socrates says, this is an annoying objection. It doesn't count. Um, uh, so they get to the end of that, and uh, Mino, not happy, because he likes his circular definitions, because he's an idiot, um, uh, decides to ask, well, is uh, absolute knowledge um, even learnable at all. Um, so in particular, he thinks he's being asked to do something impossible by Plato, uh, by uh, Socrates, sorry. Um, uh, where is it? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, so Mino asks uh, this thing. So this, this is a shift in what the, what the story is about. Uh, the paradox of inquiry, either we know something or we don't, Socrates. And I'm sure it, and he's blaming Socrates for making him forget what excellence is, because he was sure he knew before Socrates confused him. Um, if we don't know something, uh, we don't know, sorry, if we do know something, we don't need to inquire into it any further. Meanwhile, if we don't know what it is, then we can't inquire into it, because we don't know what we're looking for, and we wouldn't recognise it if we found it. Or it's uh, in, in the text. How will you search for something, Socrates, when you don't know what it is? If you know what it is, you don't need to look for it. If you don't know what it is, even if you come right up against it, uh, how will you know that it's the unknown thing that you're looking for? And Socrates points out this is a horrible separate discussion. Do you realise what a controversy you're conjuring up, Mino? Uh, the claim that it's impossible to either search for what you know or what you don't, um, and therefore that searching is impossible, uh, this is a, a very annoying thing for you to uh, complain about. And Mino asks, well, doesn't, doesn't my argument strike you as sound, Socrates? Socrates says, no, it doesn't. Uh, and then he has to prove why it doesn't. Uh, so Socrates' general answer is the theory of recollection, or anamnesis, uh, which I particularly like. Uh, forgot to put in the computer game picture for this. Anyway, so learning knowledge uh, is a lot like remembering, Socrates says. Um, certainly, uh, this is something that if you've learned uh, lots of stuff and they've eventually made sense, um, when you've come across some algebra and, oh, uh, I now fully see how that comes about, uh, you will say the sensation is quite a lot like remembering something that you used to know, uh, because, yeah, it's just correct. So the point is that uh, this business of this, this objection that you can't learn about what you don't know about already, of Mino, is not a legitimate objection uh, because learning can be done, Socrates says, in a way where you end up with no doubt, no inductive doubt that you're, um, so in, in more modern philosophy, you have the problem of induction. Um, that you, you don't have the problem that it's uh, just down to uh, unreliable experience that you're getting some conclusion. Uh, instead, Socrates argues that you can achieve by sort of inward reflection uh, and answering questions, you can learn in a way which is not dependent on experience, and uh, in this way you can actually obtain definitely certain absolute knowledge um, without uh, some of the problem, without the problem that uh, you won't recognise it if you found it. Um, this is hugely similar to Immanuel Kant's concept of synthetic a priori knowledge, uh, which roughly answers the question, how is mathematics possible? Um, I'll, I'll be doing this in a few weeks' time, but how is it that when you say, in Euclidean geometry, Pythagoras' theorem is true, uh, how is it that that conclusion that you make, uh, how, do you, how do you explain how this conclusion carries the absolute certainty that it obviously does have? Uh, philosophically, it's difficult to say why well, your conclusion has absolute certainty. Synthetic a priori knowledge is one way that it can have absolute certainty and yet also be something that you've learned that you didn't previously know. Anyway, uh, theory of recollection. A uh, specific example of this. So Socrates shows, and he gets uh, Mino to uh, send, in his, uh, send in this uh, boy who's his servant, and Socrates says, I'm not going to teach him anything. Um, now this is Socrates pulling a trick. I'm only going to ask questions, and I'm going to demonstrate that he learns some knowledge. And furthermore, the knowledge that he's got is absolutely correct at the end, even though he started off not knowing what it was. 
So this is his demonstration. Uh, given, I've changed the units, a one meter square, what is the side length of a square with double the area? An easy question uh, for all engineers. So you've got your one meter square, which he draws for this kid, and he asks the kid, what is the side length of the square with double the area? It's just a question. The kid says, two meters. And Socrates asks, is it? The boy says, yes. Socrates says, can you draw it for me? Still does questions. Uh, the kid draws this. Socrates asks, what's the area? Slightly cheats. Can you count? And the kid counts four meters squared. Socrates asks, is that right? No. Socrates is very happy at this point because only by asking questions, he's taken this kid from saying that he knows something to knowing that he doesn't know something. And he gets Mino to admit this is actually an improvement in the kid's state uh, from going to thinking he knows something to knowing that he doesn't. Um, and then Socrates, continuing to, this is a bit of a cheat, but continuing to ask questions, says, so you got this, uh, you drew this uh, two by two square. The kid says yes. <laughs> Socrates asks, what happens if you draw this red line through one of the small squares? Socrates asks, what is the area on that side of the red line? The kid says, half a square meter. Socrates asks, what's the area on each of the internal sides of those uh, diagonal lines? The kid says, half a square meter. What's the total size, two square meters? What's the side length of a square where the diagonal is, uh, uh, sorry, what's the side length of a square which has the side length uh, that gives an area twice the original area? It's the diagonal. So the kid who was only asked questions ends up with some uh, knowledge, which is a nice uh, sort of absolute mathematical knowledge, of which there is no doubt. So that's the theory of uh, recollection, and it is put forward to show it is actually worth looking for answers to questions. Um, it should be possible uh, with a suitable method of inquiry where you just ask, uh, you ask uh, someone else or you ask yourself questions. Um, so having proved that you can obtain knowledge, Socrates comes back to a, uh, an attempt at uh, answering, uh, he wants to answer what is excellence, Mino doesn't want him to, he just wants that he's a bit knackered by this point and just wants the answer to the question, can excellence be taught? Socrates moans uh, and then gives the uh, gives his answer. Um, so he's shown knowledge, uh, knowledge can be uh, recollected uh, or loosely taught. And then if excellence is a kind of knowledge, then it can be recollected or taught. Um, then he goes back, well, we have this definition. Um, excellence was the desire and means of obtaining goods. And they are, so Socrates argues, it takes a bit of a while, but uh, all of these list of good, of, of virtues that Mino had, like courage and justice, were, sorry, courage, uh, were only good if accompanied by knowledge of what outcomes are actually good. So in other words, are the things that you want, uh, the things which you think are good, is this correctly oriented? Uh, so. This is not quite the final answer in the Republic, by the way, uh, but it's a decent working answer uh, that excellence looks a lot like the knowledge of what is the correct outcome to be wanting to get, as well as the ability to get it. But it looks like the key element of excellence is knowledge of correct things that you want. And then that says, well, that's nicely tied up. Um, uh, excellence uh, looks like it's uh, it's some, something accompanied by knowledge, hence excellence is a kind of knowledge, hence teachable, solved. Uh, Mino is very happy with this, and Socrates thinks this is still a bit of a bum argument, um, because, partly because he's annoyed he hasn't been asked, allowed to ask his own favourite question, he's only been made to look into the property of if excellence is teachable. So Socrates' main concern is that he's been annoying people for decades by asking them questions, and he's always been especially interested in the question, can someone make me excellent? Uh, can you teach excellence? And although loads and loads of professional experts have claimed to be able to uh, take their students and make them excellent, uh, none of them, in Socrates' opinion, ever have, uh, because they've never had a 100% success rate, and he's always found flaws in, their, um, in the logic of what they're going to tell people to do in order to become excellent. So Socrates is not convinced that excellence has ever been taught, and from the flaws in the arguments that people have used to say it can be taught, he makes a small additional step and said, uh, excellence has never been taught in the past, 
and these people who used to rule Athens really well, uh, well, their sons turned out to be lousy rulers. And so from that he decides uh, there are no people who teach excellence, uh, therefore, actually, it can't be taught. A bit disappointing, uh, but he says it can't. So um, he gets into trouble with another one of the characters who eventually goes on to be one of the uh, people who get um, historically Socrates condemned to death uh, for impiety. Uh, but the conclusion of Mino is that if uh, excellence was knowledge, it could be taught. It looks like this is the case, um, but actually the closest you can get Oh, summarizing a bit, is not uh, knowledge. You can't, uh, in any absolute way, uh, do some procedure that will guarantee excellence. Uh, the best you can hope for is right opinion. And so excellence is partly a fluke. They also more or less say this is a placeholder theory, and the actual uh, full answer is coming up in the Republic, uh, where it's at least possible that excellence is teachable. Uh, what is right opinion, by the way? Well, if you want to go on, a, if you're going to go on a trip to the city of Larissa, is Larissa a city, or is it a region? It's a city. If you want to go on, a, if you want to go on a trip to Larissa, uh, you might uh, you might have been there before and you know the way, or you might just have right opinion. And so, an example of right opinion is, well, someone tells you, well, you go this far, and then there's this olive tree on the left, and you take that turning, and so this guy goes down the road. The olive tree's been cut down, and there's been a like, cypress tree growing instead. Uh, but this guy doesn't recognize a cypress tree, thinks it's an olive tree, takes the turning, and achieves the successful trip to Larissa, uh, not because he knew what he was doing, but because he was lucky enough to have the right opinion. Socrates says this is the best that you can do in terms of guaranteeing success. Uh, you can just be fortunate enough uh, to inculcate uh, some correct opinions. But unfortunately, these things are not grounded in the same way that uh, absolute mathematical knowledge is grounded, therefore no guarantee of success, and therefore doesn't look great uh, for um, universities' plans or whatever to remain at the top of the league tables forever. Um, at least if you take the conclusion from Mino, not achievable. Uh, you, can only, uh, you can only hope for the best. There are probably some reasonable ways to go about getting right opinion. But the question, can you go further and absolutely guarantee success? Answer looks so far like no. So that's where, uh, that's, uh, that's, that's where I got to. Not grounded is the key word. So if somebody just thinks they know the correct thing to do is from the dialogue the best they can do. Uh, so you might enjoy reading it. I, I, do, I do recommend Plato to you for some entertainment in the summer. Uh, and I hope that, uh, I hope that uh, is a, a useful... Uh, more zoomed out uh, overview about some, some discussions about uh, what might be done in projects, and something a bit more exciting than a seminar on the algebra of image processing, which uh, it makes a change for me. Anyway. Right, so uh, thank you very much, and uh, I'll uh, uh, hopefully uh, see some of you next week. Uh, thank you.